everybody, Stephanie here with the Machine Gun Nest with our newest legal update. So a lot has happened regarding uh, rare breeds, forced reset trigger, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So you might be asking yourself if you're just joining us on this journey, what is a forced reset trigger? Now, wherever you stand on the aisles, uh, I never want to preach to the choir, so whether you support the Second Amendment or not, this is a really important issue for you to understand and kind of decide where you stand on this. So what is a forced reset trigger? Well, rare breed firearms developed this drop-in trigger pack for the AR-15 that essentially forces a reset on the trigger. And now for the FRT. With the bolt locked, round in the chamber, and safety off, the cycle of operation begins as the shooter squeezes the trigger. The round fires. As the round passes the gas port, most of that gas is vented through the gas tube and begins the process of sending the bolt to the rear. When that process starts, the bolt unlocks. The empty brass is then extracted from the chamber and ejected from the firearm. As the bolt moves to the rear, it cocks the hammer, which is the point in the cycle of operation where our FRT is different from a standard mil-spec trigger. In our patented design, as the bolt cocks the hammer, the hammer forces a reset on the trigger, which pushes the shooter's finger forward. Simultaneously, as the trigger is forced into a reset, the locking bar pivots into position, mechanically locking the trigger, preventing it from functioning again until the cycle of operation is complete. As the spring behind the buffer pushes the bolt forward, a new round is stripped from the magazine. That new round is then forced into the chamber. As the bolt closes and locks into place, that locking bar disengages, which allows for the cycle to be repeated. But what's important about this is that no matter what, it is still requiring a rearward action of the trigger to release one round. So it's still one round per trigger pull. So that is by very definition what a semi-automatic weapon is. So a fully automatic releases more than one round per trigger pull, and a semi-automatic action releases one round per trigger pull. So if you've seen any videos of these force reset triggers, they are super cool, and it looks like it might be a fully automatic machine gun, but according to the definition as set by the ATF, it is still releasing one round per trigger pull. And again, we're gonna be linking the animation uh, to that now rear breed has been very open and transparent about how this mechanism works so that you can see for yourself that one rearward uh, action of the trigger is releasing one round. So, Gun Owners of America, which is a phenomenal organization, magically got their hands on an internal circulation in the ATF. Now, this was an email sent out to all of the agents. It was an agency-wide communication giving permission to agents to go ahead and retrieve by any means necessary these force reset triggers. So what happened? How did we, we find ourselves here? Well, what happened was the ATF decided to arbitrarily, because they don't like this, uh, especially under this current administration, to redefine machine gun to include these forced reset triggers. But the problem is this. According to this definition of machine gun, which like I said, is something that releases more than one round per rearward action of the trigger, this doesn't actually fit. So what the ATF is doing is they are abusing current language that is currently on the books, uh, mainly the Hughes Amendment to FOPA, which is the Firearm Owners Protection Act. So what is going on? All of this might sound confusing. You might be thinking, well, why do I care? You know, I'm looking at these videos and that looks scary to me and I don't think people should be able to own such a, such a device. Obviously, we differ from you regarding that, but this is why it matters. Right now, the ATF has decided to change the definition of machine gun and therefore criminalizing law-abiding citizens overnight. Now, if you value our constitutional republic at all, you should know that whatever your desired outcome of your desired outcome should never supersede the legal processes we have in place to enact change. And right now, you're giving a government organization way too much power by saying, you know what, I don't like those guns, I don't like what it makes it do. So go ahead and change your definition and criminalize law-abiding citizens overnight. You might be happy with that outcome now, but once the government has the power to do that, that precedent is terrifying and you might not like what they're going to do next if it affects your life. So back to this internal circulation. So it has been uh, allegedly reported that the ATF has indeed raided a gun shop in the state of Illinois. Um, we've all seen the letter that is spreading like wildfire across the interwebs. Um, regarding the ATF's plans to 
steal private property from dealers. And of course, I'm referring to the FRT 15. Although I cannot yet authenticate this letter that's, you know, allegedly being circulated by the ATF, I can tell you that we've received word from one dealer in Illinois late yesterday afternoon stating that the ATF had paid them a visit, hand delivered them a cease and desist, and then quote unquote had taken FRT 15s uh, from them. I've yet to actually speak to anyone at this dealer, so I have zero details to share. I don't know anything um, about that. Um, I'm trying to make contact, but right now I'm jumping through hoops to deal with you know the issue. Now, right now, we don't know if they went in guns blazing and forced this seizure or if the gun shop complied. Now, if you purchased a rare breed FRT, um, you might be thinking, what do I do with this right now? I'm kind of nervous. Firearms Policy Coalition has sent out a phenomenal guide. We're going to be linking that below if somebody does come knocking on your door. Right now, they aren't really going after individuals. It's more gun shops, but the purpose of all of this is so that they can actually come after individuals. So if somebody does come knock on your door, only speak through a lawyer. Do not sign anything. I'm not giving legal advice. That's not my that's not my realm here, so we're gonna just guide you back to Firearms Policy Coalition there. But uh, don't be scared, don't be worried, just kind of follow those steps and know that there are really great organizations that are fighting on our behalf of the Second Amendment to protect that right. Now, what is lying ahead? So Rear Breed has gone to federal court with the ATF, with the DOJ regarding this issue. Now, David Smith was the man who initially con conducted the first investigation of this device and like I said Rear Breed has been very transparent about how this mechanism actually works now I don't think that David Smith actually watched that video or has an understanding of how this device works because in his report he didn't even link to the video he just included a screenshot of the video but still concluded that this does qualify as a machine gun all actions being taken are based on an illegitimate exam and a falsified report now I'm gonna give you guys just one. I mean, the exam and report are just chock full of trash, but I'm gonna give you an example of one. Mr. Smith stated in the report that the bolt carrier's forward movement automatically releases the trigger and hammer, allowing the weapon to expend a second projectile without a separate pull of the trigger. Now this is completely inaccurate and entirely untrue. And he, in my opinion, intentionally and maliciously left out a very important step that actually makes the FRT-15 a semi-automatic trigger. So what step did he leave out? Let's talk about that. When the carrier comes forward and strikes the locking bar, the trigger is unlocked. Only after the trigger is unlocked can it be functioned. And of course, functioning the trigger to the rear is what releases the hammer. It's very clear, it's very simple. He's intentionally trying to mischaracterize the truth. And how do I know that this wasn't a mistake or an accident on Mr. Smith's part? Well, as most of you already know, we've got an animated video posted on our homepage that clearly demonstrates exactly how the FRT-15 functions. It's plain, it's simple, and it can't be misunderstood, especially by someone that examinates firearms as a profession for the ATF. He can't misunderstand that. And heck, did he even bother to function test the FRT-15 uninstalled or installed in an AR-15? It takes less than a second to manually push the locking bar forward with your thumb. It takes less than a second to push the locking bar forward with your thumb to see that it doesn't release the trigger and hammer. Further, it's plainly obvious that the FRT can only expend one round per rearward function of the trigger. To say anything different is entirely disingenuous. So anyway, how do I know that this step being left out was intentional and malicious? Well, it's super simple. Mr. Smith didn't include our animated video in his examination and report. He included a screenshot of the video. So 
including a screenshot proves he knew about the video, but he made a conscious decision rather than to include a full video that is very clear to choose one still image and include it in his report so that it would support his mischaracterization of the truth. And then of course, the ATF and DOJ filed a motion in limine to prevent us from submitting that same exact video into evidence. They didn't want the judge to see the video. It's very clear. They did not want the judge to see the video. They chose to add a still image of the video into the administrative record, but chose to leave the actual video out of the administrative record. Well, that was done by design. And I feel that David Smith and Earl Griffith have intentionally created and released an illegitimate exam and report. Absolutely. So I'm not a cynic, but I can't help but think that the ATF is acting with some malice and malintent here, and it's not just incompetence. I think that it's a healthy dose of both, and that's really worrisome because we don't want these government agencies essentially legislating through executive fiat. That's not how a constitutional republic operate. And speaking of David Smith, the ATF and the DOJ have been preventing him from taking the stand. And his very own supervisor said on the stand during the federal hearing between Rare Breed and the DOJ, that if you were to put him on the stand to testify to the veracity of his report, that he would be committing perjury. Brian Lutke, he is one of the expert witnesses in this case, he's a former ATF special agent, and he actually trained David Smith at the ATF Academy. Now, Brian Lukey took the stand and testified under oath that if Mr. Smith were to take the stand and testify to the accuracy of his report, that he would be committing perjury. He said that under oath on the stand that David Smith would be committing perjury if he testified to the accuracy of his report. So maybe, maybe, that's why they refused to allow him to take the stand. So all of these subsequent actions that the ATF is looking to take are contingent upon the veracity of this report. And right now we kind of know that the report is just a bunch of trash. So. Uh, we'll keep you updated as more of this develops. Again, don't be worried, don't be scared.